And we're back for another episode of Startup Hustle, a podcast for entrepreneurs by entrepreneurs. If you want to start, own, or build a business, then you're in the right place. We bring you the real truth about what it's like to take something from concept to launch, from growth, innovation, experience, failing, or winning big, we've got you covered. So let's get down to business with another episode of Startup Hustle, brought to you by Fullscale.io. And we're back. Another episode of Startup Hustle. Matt DeCourcy here with Andrew Morgans. We're about to talk about e-commerce, people. And I will say we're pretty darn excited about that. Now, this is part one of a four-part series all about e-commerce. And you know, e-commerce, it's everywhere. It's a really broad topic. It goes from everything from web stores to Amazon to a whole bunch of different stuff. And we have some expertise with that. Now, before we get into what we're going to talk about in all par- all four parts of this series, I do want to let you know that the entire series is being sponsored by Clarinity. Now, Clarinity is solving the most complex problems in e-commerce through cloud-based inventory management and operations optimization. So what does that mean? We're going to tell you all about it. Now, first off, I mentioned I'm here with Andrew Morgans, who's one of the co-hosts on Startup Hustle. He's got a weekly spot about e-commerce. Hi, Andrew. What's up, guys? It's good to be on the show with Matt again. Yeah, it's been a while since we've done one together, huh? Yeah, it has, and uh, it feels good to have a, a co-host with me today. Yeah, and that's and that's always a lot of fun. And you know, we we wanted to get this series started because you and I both have a lot of history and input when it comes to e-commerce. Now, before we get too far into that, let's talk about this four-part series because you know these are these are something we're trying to do a little bit more of as we move forward with Startup Hustle, and we can when we can find. Uh, sponsors like Clarinity, who provided a great deal of outline and input and even helped to schedule some guests for subject matter related to what we're going to talk about today, which is going to start with the history and evolution of e-commerce. Now I'm old, so I get some old school input on that one. Uh, we're going to talk, the episode two will be about accounting in e-commerce. And you know, if you can't keep track of your numbers and you can't figure any of that out, it's not good. Right. And then you're talking about organizing your inventory in general. And episode four will be related to leadership skills for e-commerce teams and businesses. And that fourth episode is where we're going to sit down and we're going to talk about how you bundle everything up from these first three episodes into a successful strategy. Once again, companies like Clarinity out there to help you get that done. Scroll down, click the link in the show notes and you can follow along with what they do and we'll talk about it. But, you know, Andrew, I got a question. I got, I, I want to start. I mean, what what's e-commerce? Well, it's been defined as the process of purchasing of available goods and services over the internet using secure connections and electronic payment services. Buying stuff what does online. that mean? Right. <laughs> Buying stuff online, right. Buying stuff online. Yeah. And yeah, so, you know, a little... Uh, Go ahead. I was just going to say it's it's changed from obviously when we first started buying stuff online to now, and we're going to get into that. Um, it's gotten easier and easier and easier for us um, as we've gotten more trust in the internet. And so I think that's really one of the main things behind the evolution has been trust by the public. Yeah. And you talk about, you know, when you read the definition, that wasn't the same definition or it wasn't as clear cut years ago. Now, you know, we're going to get, we're going to just briefly go back and touch a few moments in the timeline to give some context. Cause you know, people are like, when was the internet invented? All right. So on a, on a real basis, you're talking 1971, right? And, and now when it wasn't until 89, when you've got the, that's the WWW, the worldwide net. Prior to that, it was scientific or it had some military applications and different stuff like that. Do you remember the, fir- would you remember the first time you saw the internet? Yes. And I'm not as old as you, but you're not old either. Uh, but I, you know, I grew up, I won't take too long on this, but I grew up with um, computers. My dad was building them. And so I do feel like even though I'm a bit younger, I was, I was introduced early. Um, I can, me personally, 
uh, you know, I think it would be when I first had dial up in the U S it was on a trip back from Africa. It was probably 94. I was eight or nine. I feel like I was, I was, uh, getting access to the internet with my dad and kind of trying to figure it out. Yeah. I mean, so in 89, I was 14 years old and I remember I went to, a, I was a freshman in high school and I went to a party at, at one of the popular girls from my school's house and her little brother was messing around on the internet. And I'm, I, I'm going to keep it clean cause I'm not going to tell you what he showed me. Uh, but it has a lot to do with what a lot of the internet is these days. And I was like, Whoa, that's crazy. It wasn't. And quite honestly, I didn't really see a whole lot of it. Uh, cause you know, still then that was kind of rare. You're talking about dial up and really slow internet speed and, you know, a, a, and a quick evolution began now. And th at that point, I mean, much like people were saying about computers, people, not everyone was taking the internet seriously. It was, it was, I don't want to say everyone was saying it was a fad, but it was in 1994 that Cadabra Inc., came out and later became Amazon. Now we've heard of that. And that's, that's obviously a lot to do with your business at Marknology, uh, where you help, you know, brands, uh, build their brand. And you, you have companies like Clarinity that help people get everything going on, you know, with their brand, everything from standard operating procedures to cloud-based automation and stuff like that. But in 94, if you set in the cloud, people would have looked up in the sky. Right. You know, and back then it was annoying. You needed either you need to have enough money to have a second phone line or else the Internet was taking up your ability to get calls at the house. And, you know, so it was something that was I feel like the people that weren't into it was like, get off the Internet. You know, I'm trying to get I'm trying to make a call. Uh, it was more an annoyance than, you know, a blessing. Yeah. And that was, you know, I remember, you know, that that's exactly true. You couldn't get a phone call through to people sometimes for like a day because, you know, it was just busy, busy, busy. And, and that I remember hearing the screeching sound of the modem and, you know, how annoying that was. Now, you know, when, when Amazon wasn't always Amazon, but to give you context, I mean, that's, that's 26 years ago. It's not like they're a new company. They weren't an overnight sensation and they actually started as a book publisher. So in that same year is when you start to see security protocols come out like H HTTP and DSL. Now this, this, uh, uh, it was 94 when Pizza Hut, started taking online orders. Now it wasn't until 2007 that they actually had it for all their stores. Now, if you are, if you're older than 25, you probably remember at some level CompuServe and AOL and like the bulk, almost like the spam mail of the, the discs, the discs everywhere. Now my dad, he still has his AOL address. So um, that stuck with some people, but you remember those, those, uh, you know, the, the discs coming and, you know, it was like setting the internet up was, it was a bit of a task right. and, you know, like I, and now it's just an expectation. Like I, you can't go anywhere without people. Well, do they have Wi-Fi here? And like, if you go somewhere without Wi-Fi, it's almost like they dropped you in a cave and, you know, you didn't get to get to, I don't know, you're certainly no Wi-Fi. You're definitely talking dial-up speeds. And then it was in 1998, Victoria's Secret, which Victoria's Secret started because there was an entrepreneur that wanted to be able to buy lingerie for his wife and he didn't like going to the store. So, I mean, that obviously became a, became a huge deal. But it wasn't until really after 2000, you know, we had a famous dot-com boom and bust and a whole lot of other stuff, but you know, it, it, things were very wild west still at this point. You know, there wasn't an evolution that had really occurred. People were still trying to figure out what is this, what does it do, what are we going to use it for? Is it a fad? Is it just something I play solitaire with my friends on? Or you know, you had these old fashioned chat communities. Like, what was do, what were some of the things that you remember with the old school internet? Like doing a lot of like, what was the first time the internet really got its hooks in you? Man, um, well, Google wasn't a thing um, as far as like, you know, information wasn't that easy to get. I feel like the Google search engine changed the game, you know, um, but I remember just honestly, I was in Africa and the biggest thing for me was 
being able to, it was $10 a minute to call home, to call back to Kansas City. And I could use email to talk to all my friends. And, you know, it was literally going to an internet cafe with a floppy disk, dialing up, you know, downloading my emails to this floppy disk, going home, reading them, replying, coming back the next day, trying to log in and, you know, email back. So for me, that was kind of my email experience at an early age, um, you know, using it to communicate. So now all of a sudden you enter in the 2000s, you're past the dot coms. And, you know, I think that's a pretty relevant thing to, to, to discuss briefly because all of a sudden, all right, so as Roy Rogers once said, uh, buy real estate because they're not making any more of it. Well, that whole, that whole concept blew up when the internet came because all of a sudden you had the dot com and you actually could have real estate online. Now, do, you, do you remember the actual dot com boom? Because like, you had things like pets.com and different things, companies going public and just go, people, they, they overvalued them significantly because what they didn't factor in to the profitability and the possibility with these companies was the amount of expense you'd have customer acquisition, uh, logistics and different stuff like that. So, you know, people didn't know, but so many companies got grossly overvalued and you had a very pronounced bubble that occurred in the NASDAQ and, you know, the, the prices were shooting up and then all this, they literally cratered. Do, do you remember any of that? Do you remember being dialed in at any of that point? I don't. I don't think I knew what was happening on the business side, um, you know, of the internet in those days. Yeah, and that was you know, that was at that point. I, I'm in my mid twenties, and I remember it because I, I was talking to people that I had that went to, I went to college with, and some of them were like, "Oh, I've been buying and selling stocks," and like you know, much like the the real estate housing bubble in the in the uh, 2008. You know, if you were on the good side of it, you made a bunch of money on rental homes. And if you're on the bad side of it, you still might you still might be trying to get on the good side of it. So, you know, you saw these things go and like no one really knew what everything was capable of. And, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, there was a lack of evolution in the internet. So at this point, and we go back to your original definition where you you're talking about the uh, well, feeling safe, secure. At that point, people mm -hmm. didn't want to put their credit card in on the internet. Like they, no one trusted it, and, and you know that's and that was obviously that was obviously a problem. And also, you didn't have things like Prime on mm -hmm. Amazon or like I don't know. People had no expectations. There was no real structure around what you could do. And another thing too is at this point, you mentioned Google hadn't come out in the prior timeline. Well, search engines start coming out and. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, in the uh, Yahoo, Google, AOL, I mean, there was a bunch of them. You remember like Ask Jeeves? Yeah, and I love Ask Jeeves. Yeah, like some of these, you know, CompuServe and, and all this different stuff. And, and this whole world of technology starts, you know, the web browser wasn't a thing, uh, you know, in Internet Explorer and its fight with, uh, you know, uh, other stuff. And like, I mean, there was no laws, there was no regulation, there was nothing. And one of the things we'll talk about a little bit when it comes to the accounting episode was people didn't know how to tax the, the transactions either. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's, I mean, something you can run into so much now, you know, and, and that's something that, I mean, that comes up with what you do quite a bit, isn't it? Taxation? It sure does. And honestly, in the last two years, there's been a lot of changes, um, you know, on Amazon in regards to tax and tax nexus and things like that. So it's ever changing. And honestly, like the things you're talking about, it being the Wild West is why I've been so passionate about it. I mean, I just feel like it's a it's a space that's, you know, being carved out as we speak and the kind of the final frontier when it comes to business. And um, that's definitely what where my passion is tied to. And, and for you, that actually started here in Kansas City with a local toy store, right? Well, actually, it started um, right before that uh, at, a at a startup in Tampa. I went there for one year for this job, and um, we, were, we had four websites, four different businesses, RV parts, um, motorcycle parts, uh, trailer hitches, hitchanything.com, and we were putting car parts up by the thousands hundreds of thousands i might i don't want to say i put a million car parts online but i i would guess that i had and um and 
in those days, it was not all Amazon focused, you know, it was traditional e-commerce websites, you know, placing those trust badges everywhere you could and, you know, trying to build trust uh, in the early days. And eBay was actually a bigger player than than Amazon. Yeah, and that's a great point because eBay was really the the birth of the online marketplace and the auction site. And, you know, that was for e-commerce standards was, I mean, the whale like that. I mean, they had, they were dominating and that was a place to, you know, it, it's funny because you take these things for granted now in 2020 and you look back at these timelines and you're talking about being in Tampa and, you know, that was, that was what, 10 years ago, mm -hmm. right? So take 10 years before that, like you didn't have things like Shopify and WooCommerce and, and like all these different kinds of carts and, and, and plugins and integrations and, you know, and, and that made it really difficult. It made things in, it made, it, it just, it was, it definitely wasn't secure. It wasn't safe. And from a search engine standpoint, it was highly gameable. So I remember in the early 2000s, if you had a website, you could add like a zillion meta tags that, you know, were, were not seen on the front side of the page and, you know, search engines weren't sophisticated. And, you know, the search engine is what really changed stuff. And, and when it comes to the history of the internet and all that, I think a lot of people don't understand Google and how it came about and why it dominated. So you have you have Larry Page and Sergey Brin, and these guys are research scientists, and they believe that that the web browser and the search engine are the way of the future. Now, you know, with that, they have to build technology that crawls the internet and looks for all these pages and does a whole bunch of different stuff. It's got a level of sophistication. And then they are trying to create an interface which people could search for clarinity or whatever they wanted and they get results. But what most people don't know is you have to figure out how you're going to rank a site above the other. So those guys are research scientists and part of how they... Uh, determined that had to do with links that came in from other sites. Because in the world of research science, a footnote is an acknowledgement. It's street cred. It's saying, hey, we recognize this other article as having, we're either quoting it or saying something about it. So what, and they don't rely on this the same way, but they created a page rank. Mm -hmm. that came with it. So now search engines are becoming more sophisticated. They were looking at what the text was that was pointing to another site. And if enough sites were, so you say uh, 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 board games, and if this, you know, some site had a whole bunch of other sites linked to it, and that text in those links said board games, well, then that should rank high for board games. And, you know, you get you and now the, the world of SEO is born search engine optimization, which in the very beginning, sure, it was a thing, but there definitely was an industry that went around it. Now, you know, in that time, if you had any clue what you were doing, you could game it. Yes. You could game it. And it wasn't until uh, it wasn't until the mid 2000s. So the, when I began my history with e-commerce, and, and as you're aware, Andrew, I used to work for a musical instrument manufacturer, Roland. And at that time, and this is what's so significant about e-commerce and the internet is, okay, at this point, now you've got some official disruption beginning, meaning the brick and mortar retail is having to either adapt and evolve or, and many were beginning to die. So, and that was the, the interesting part with my job. So you had companies like Guitar Center and Andrew, you're, you're a, a musician. So you've bought stuff at Guitar Center and that was really like the site to buy music stuff, but it created it, it, it just for commerce, manufacturing and distribution in general, it created this really like urgent need to begin defining rules and 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 you know you you see things like map minimum advertised pricing and all this stuff and it really began to become disruptive it was in the mid 2000s where i really started to realize that that well first off the ma and pa stores were going to have a hard time because like you look in the music industry there was some, you know, here's Andrew's music and in Kansas City. And, you know, that's where everyone goes. They buy guitar picks and strings and pedals. All of a sudden, it's easier to buy that online. So now they're not buying it at the store. That particular store, if they didn't have the ability to build an e-commerce site, well, they were going to start losing a lot of business. And, 
and and smartphones i think weren't necessarily a thing and so we weren't using google to essentially find places in real life right now we google them we read a yelp review which is all econ or is all web and then we go to that physical restaurant you know but that wasn't or the your case. phone even tells you how to it tells you how to get there I mean, dude, you didn't even the, at that point. Well, okay. So, and I'm going to date myself because I have a very interesting timeline when it comes to my true dive into e-commerce, which was 2009. Now you've read my book, Million Dollar Bedroom, and you know that that's where it really, really started for me. Okay. At that point, we're talking iPhone 2. Right. And that was back when it was like data was so precious. Like you, I mean, you weren't connected to the internet everywhere you go. You certainly weren't connecting your laptop to your phone. I mean, none of that stuff was happening, but iPhone too, bro. That was just over 10 years ago. How old do you feel now? I mean, honestly, in some ways I feel old as hell when it comes to e-commerce. I've just, you know, in the same way you're describing Google, Amazon went through the same things. You know, when I first got into it, Amazon was not sophisticated, honestly, and it uh, was could be gamified. And, you know, now I've seen it go from being able to be gamified to having to be a, a true, you know, platform that brands are, are treating like a legitimate marketplace. Um, and I mean, in just such a short amount of time, it's come leaps and bounds. I mean, I have a little device that gives me Wi-Fi in 160 countries now, so I can just connect anywhere. Um, thinking about that existing even five years ago is, is crazy. So, and, and these little stamps along the way are important and it, it's what it kind of makes me chuckle. So you mentioned, and for those of you that haven't heard Andrew's other episodes of Startup Hustle, Andrew spent a significant amount of time growing up in Africa and you talk about, and now he's here in Kansas city and, but you talk about that 10 minute, $10 a minute to call from here or there. It was in 2009 when I, when someone I, I had was hiring the first employees that I had hired in the Philippines and most of which still work for me now, but I, I didn't want to call and I wasn't really able to call. And someone says to me, he goes, you should check out this new thing. It's called Skype. <laughs> so that's 2009, man. That's for just 10 years ago. And that's not that long. That's yeah. not that long ago. And I was blown away that with at the time, you know, I was just like, you could get, it was a grainy kind of crappy picture, but it was free. Yeah. And I was like, dude, this is super cool. Now at that point, people had begun to become a little conditioned. Like we had the, the, uh, you know, the messenger and like that kind of chat and different stuff like that, but it certainly wasn't seeing someone halfway around the world. And it certainly wasn't free. And so like, I, I, I I remember that. I was just like, that was mind blown for me. I was like, oh my God, this is crazy. Like it's going to be, th at this point you're thinking like, I'm going to be, when am I going to, a year from now I'll be 3D and they'll see me. Uh, that's not the way it worked out. What, well, what do you have to say? I got to give my dad credit for introducing me to, you know, so many techie. He's, a, you know, he's a nerd. And from being a kid building the computers, like the motherboards and stuff all the way up till, you know, he's pushing me to do Skype or WeChat or some of these other programs, I definitely got to give him credit for that. I, I wanted to bounce back to when we talked about eBay just briefly, I was thinking about PayPal and how PayPal oh, yeah. changed the game yeah, for, for, for transactions mm -hmm. online. And that's what gave eBay credibility was this safe, secure way to pay. And um, I really do think that that, you know, now we have Amazon and we have all this trust. We really trust, you know, digital almost more so than anything else. But uh, PayPal, game changer. Yeah. And, you know, that you have a great point. So, you know, there's so many things now, like you talk about PCI compliance, pay, payment, payment card industry compliance, which guarantees that you're, that there are certain specific standards and safety. Uh, so in 2009, it, it, I was preparing to launch my first e-commerce site, which um, there weren't things like, like I said, like Shopify and WooCommerce, some of that, there were some things out, they were clunky. And it was very difficult to find companies like Clarinity, who's sponsoring the show, that had expertise and domain knowledge. Now, Clarinity is a cool company because they can help you with like 
20 different things, you know, and, and there's times when you, ha- when you need a sword and there's times when you need a Swiss army knife, but, um, you know, in their case, they can help you figure out what kind of tech you use and, and create standard operating procedures and stuff like that. Now, dude, in 2009, that was, people were still very much figuring that stuff out. Amazon's still very much a bookseller at this point. eBay's where most transactions are occurring. And for me, my story began because a site that was once known as Liquid Tickets a few years earlier became StubHub and became a place where we, I mean, I built a business around that. And eBay, eBay owned, well, they did own StubHub until earlier this year or maybe a year ago. And, you know, that was a big thing. And, and the PayPal part of it, uh, I just re- remember how unsophisticated it was and like how much different crap we had to go through. And in many cases, it was left up to innovators to try to build their very first stuff. So, you know, I talked about this a million dollar bedroom. Uh, the reason I hired people in the Philippines is I needed developers and I needed PHP developers more specifically. Now, at this point, programmers are hard to find. They're hard mm-hmm. to find now. They were really hard to find and then specific types like that. So I was uh, trying to build a website that generated itself based off of database tables. Now, look, here in 2020, you call a company like Clear Entity and they'll upload that database and your e-commerce store will be tight and clean and perfect. Then no way, no way. I had to build it. I had to invent this kind of stuff. And uh, went about it. It was, a, it was a real dog and pony show to try to get it started. Now that said, when I got it right, the cash register went cha-ching, cha-ching. But one of the things that, that okay, it was, it was not that difficult to get found and to initiate a purchase. But at that point for us, we were still a hot mess when it came to what happened on the other side of the transaction. Yes. And you, you, you run into that a lot. I mean, you can, you can grow, go out of business or grow out of business. And that's something people have a, have a hard time with, right? Yep, it is. And, um, you know, you talk about Clarinity and cloud based solutions. And even in my own business, you know, what I do as a service is, is, uh- oftentimes growing B2C sales for brands, right? But what I do for Marknology is B2B. And there's still a lot of work to be done for Marknology. And for me, my next steps are, are getting more cloud-based. And, and you know, finding a partner like Crow Entity to do that um, can just make it so much easier. You know, I'm, I'm in this space where um, standard operating procedures don't necessarily exist and, um, you know, trying to create not only the solution, but also the, the processes for doing it can be extremely overwhelming. You know, I can spend half of a year working on one small area of my business, trying to get it to that level. And for me, as someone that loves to travel, um, and I want to be as flexible as possible, you know, with things like going on in the current environment of our country and the world right now, being flexible and being able to pivot is super important. And for me, that's, that's cloud-based. You know, it's you mentioned being travel and being able to do stuff. Like I remember at one point when our when and I I was in the t- event ticketing business, and you know the thing was is automation, business process automation, uh, connectivity, and being able to like okay, I couldn't go out boating with my friends without taking all of my inventory offline because the worst thing that would occur would be we could okay so if you have two two tickets in row h and their seats one and two you can only sell those to one person so these exchanges would be very upset if you double sold things and sometimes you know i just remember like how, how lame it was and you know it wasn't until you know two or three years into our experience where the technology even existed with with things like team viewer where you could connect to your computer from somewhere else it was a real hassle and it was very difficult and another thing too you know you talk about now we're now we're entering the the era of cloud which is like the the, you know, 2010 and past. And that early, it was, it was still very young. So you would listen to ra- the radio or stuff like that. And sometimes the host would be like, well, I don't want to mention their website because if I say something, it'll crash it. You know, and, and I, I mentioned earlier, most people don't know what the cloud is. They look up at the sky, but cloud computing is, is the, probably the single most, the driving force that enabled e-commerce to grow and to expand and to have and to and to to scale 
Cause you know, but prior so what is cloud? And this is like an, an infrastructure where the, okay. So at one point you mentioned that first startup you worked at, you know, but prior to two, the 2010s, you may have had an onsite server. If you listen to the episodes of startup hustle that I host with Matt Watson, who his original company, Venn solutions, which he sold for $150 million in 2012, they'd been out for 10 years. They're, they're, their service, their for Matt was one of the pioneers in cloud computing, and what made their business so amazing and so scalable and palatable was it did not require you to buy a server. And you know, like yes, people, that was a real thing. Like the the old school e commerce businesses and in any business that just was really beginning to rely on the internet, you had servers. We had server rooms, and here's the thing: it's like you're if you're running a car lot. You don't know anything about servers or keeping them online or updating them or keeping them secure. And here's the thing. They have a finite capacity for what they could handle. So what the cloud did was take that offsite, put it in the hands of people that know how to manage it. Now, look, we already have a recurring theme here. Get your stuff in the hands of people that get it and know how to do it. Otherwise, you have to learn how to do it. And that's, you know, back to clear entity. That's companies like this exist to not make you have to embrace that learning curve because there's so much to it, man. So in the cloud, you now have devices that are interconnected. You don't just overpower one and now the website's off. They're able to parlay off each other's available uh, excess capacity and create things that that are now interconnected. And well, or in you can this upgrade day, without this day and age, that's really, yeah. I true, was just gonna say, gonna say you could upgrade by just hey you've hit your max okay let's go to the next level that they offer mm -hmm. instead of just like you know having to buy all new equipment or being like we have to remain here for several years till we get that back in the budget. I mean U.S. Toy had a big server room, um, you know, and you have hardware ma malfunctions like, and you had to have an, an employee or two that could you know service that equipment. Um, so you're talking about not just the equipment itself but the cost involved to take care of the equipment um you know that that's and you're just removing that by offering a cloud solution there's a reason that aws is you know um even bigger than the seller central or the market marketplace side of amazon yeah so you know i was yeah, thinking AWS, uh, amazon web go ahead yes uh, uh, Amazon Web Services. I was just going to say, and taking advantage of, of the pause, whenever I was at that first company, and my degree is actually in, in networking and security. That's what I went to school for and just fell in love with e-commerce after I got out of school. Um, but I was at a knock uh, and you know, seeing physical equipment break down to the point of, you know, at MasterCard, I was working there and it was all about e-commerce you know or brick and mortar and e-commerce transactions happening for these you know these banks and um the amount of hardware breaks that happened before everything was in the cloud to provide that security was um insane if you saw what was happening on the back end of your local bank uh or a bank in brazil or oh, a bank scary. in india scary yeah. scary scary stuff well and there was tons of fraud i mean just tons of fraud and this is where cloud computing made this a little more palatable because i mentioned like you know you're at u.s toy so you're in kansas city that like, i grew up around u.s toy it's uh everything from teaching supplies to little knickknacks and and you talk about SKUs, stock keeping units uh, a lot of SKUs, a lot of things like i mean a lot of stuff thousands and you know here's the thing is you're in the business of doing that so as a as a startup founder or an entrepreneur you have to really Really begin to decide what you're going to be an expert at. And my advice to you is try to find people that can complement you. You do the things you're great at that are, are valuable. If you spend too much time trying, there's too much to learn. There's just too much to learn. And until we get that next stage of evolution where you can just upload that to your brain, it takes time, it takes effort. And so back, you know, in the pre-cloud days, uh, dude, fraud was running rampant. And the reason is, is people would have servers, but they didn't know how to update them. They weren't doing it correctly. Like it was just out of sight, out of mind. There was that room that had a weird hum. It was hot, you know, like, and, and, you know, like occasionally like the, who, what's IT? Who's the IT guy? Our computer guy is going to go in there. But here's the thing is, is there was all kinds of vulnerabilities, all kinds of, you know, and, and that's part of what cloud fixes. But 
I mean, dude, we would run into that 10 years ago at the ticket company because people would steal credit card numbers and then they'd buy stuff. And because we were doing online transactions and couldn't physically collect a signature, we would lose 100% of the chargebacks. And it was, it was really frustrating for a lot of different reasons and a lot. And, and, you know, like also just like the speed of certain things, like the transactions, like now everything's lightning quick. And, you know, so, and I want to, and I want to talk a little bit about the actual cloud stuff. Cause it, at the same time, you, know, we mentioned smartphones earlier. Now you're, now you're, uh, you're entering the true acceleration of peripherals. And, you know, like the phone is now competing with the, you know, you've got laptops, which had been out for a while, but the internet and bandwidth are starting to come up. And now this, now this, this crazy thing called social media. Mm, I was, you're reading my mind. You're reading my mind. My space, my space is still like, like that was like the first one. And I remember in, uh, I think Facebook just congratulated me for being a user for 10 years. You know, and I was like, but that was it. And, you know, prior to that, MySpace and different stuff. So now, not only do you have equipment, you are going, you know, rocketing forward. And, and by the way, these things are, uh, there's a, uh, the Moore's law, which is, you know, talking about that it, you're you, about every 12 to 18 months, you can expect a double to double the power and to have the cost. And so, and that's an exponential growth pattern. And a lot of inventors were using that to try to figure out what they wanted to build. To give you some context, in this day and age, we are at that current curve, which is still supported. We're about five or six years away from you having the computing power of an iPhone and being the size of a red blood cell. How wild is that? It's real wild. It is. And, you know, now... No one, everyone, no one's computer was light. It was, none of them were fast and they, and they, and and it's big, bulky, like gross machines that were once again now. And now at this point too, you had the set you, at one point you got the second line. I remember when cable and DSL type internet came and we were all like, oh my God, this finally arrived, you know, it finally arrived. And, and, you know, but this transformation is beginning in multiple lanes and the evolutions now coming quickly. Now, you know, you talk about like, I look at some of the different stuff we did. Now I, I mentioned earlier that Google being able to be gamed. Now the technology providers became more sophisticated. So um, I did end up succeeding in building the self-generating website that I wanted. I made a more money than off of that than I would even li- like to mention online here. <laughs> but, and then I learned what a Google penalty was and it was painful people. It was painful. And honestly, a lesson I'm glad I learned early because I learned that shortcuts come back to bite you. Uh, but by the time, so at one point, and I mentioned linking and all this different stuff, I, I forced myself to become an expert in search engine optimization. And at that point, I hadn't really had a true like belly flop face plant fail as an entrepreneur, which is dangerous because you think you're bulletproof. And I did. And we, and I wrote about it in Million Dollar Bedroom. I literally went from making thousands of dollars a day passive to none at all. And I got to tell you the gut wrenching feeling I had the day I figured out that I had received a Google penalty and, and not just one, probably a couple. Oh man. The only thing that balanced it out was the fact that we made a ton of money on the way to doing it. And it was just like, you know, but it, it, it now standards are being created and there's beginning, you know, expectations, rules, boundaries, and so much are occurring. Now, Google's remarkably sophisticated now, but at that point, they hadn't really issued many penalties. Now, with what you do in your work at Amazon, does, is, you've seen some of that firsthand occur, like sellers getting booted off and different stuff like that. Do you have anything to share there? Oh my God. It's, How did uh, that change? It's, it's a big part of what we do. You know, we call brand protection. Um, and reseller agreements e-commerce reseller agreements are a thing that that um you know retailers didn't know about and haven't set up with all their distributors or or resellers um you know simply 
policing the standards with which they list and sell a brand's products. Um, you know, we have everything from uh, counterfeit being sold to people violating map pricing to, um, you know, bundling things together that are of different brands, like all kinds of, of, of issues that big, that big brands and retailers face. And, you know, a whole new area of law has come out called Amazon law. Uh, and I think the last time a new area was around marijuana. Okay. So this is the next thing. Um, and it's exploding. I mean, there's, uh, there's ability to get trademarks faster simply because Amazon needs them. So instead of the nine month waiting period, you know, Amazon has a program that can get it in 30 days, like just these all new legal side of, of things with Amazon. Like I've even gone into arbitration for a brand, um, you know, with a lawyer with Amazon lawyers and we were successful. Um, but I've probably seen, honestly, in my nine years of doing this, maybe 50 to a hundred account suspensions or, or, or more. Um, that's not even down to the product level, like one product getting suspended or something like that, but it's, it's entire accounts and it can be everything from, you know, changing bank accounts, uh, you know, without notifying Amazon or, um, you know, reviewing your own products or, uh, having duplicate accounts or, um, you know, reaching out to customers, pushing them to your website or doing things against Amazon's terms of service. And, you know, a big part of what we do is not just, uh, you know, grow brands on Amazon, but we try to keep them out of trouble. Um, and I, I, I'm sure it's very similar to a Google penalty box. Uh, but you know, with enough effort on Amazon, you can usually get something unsuspended, but it's cost. I've, I've seen it personally cost sellers hundreds of thousands of dollars. Why, why their brand is down trying to figure it out. And here's the thing, Amazon, they, they care about you until they don't like, there's so many people. I mean, this is 50, over 50% of, of e-commerce of, of e-commerce and you know that, I mean, and so there's a whole subset of stuff that's come in and now, now with that, and that kind of number. So I got right now at, at as at here in 2020. And by the way, these numbers are probably wrong because COVID like jacked the internet sales up even higher. We're at, at the time of my research, which was recent. Now we don't, you sometimes don't get these numbers until a later date. 3.5 trillion in sales worldwide, you have 24, roughly 24 million e-commerce sites. Um, Harvard Business School stating that 95% of purchase decisions are made in the subconscious, meaning like you see it on a social media ad and later somewhere else. And you're like, oh, that was the shirt I wanted to buy. Now, when it comes to, you know, like you're in the next 20 years, it's projected that 95% of all transactions are e-commerce related. Now, the good news with that is means that you're going to see a lot of transform transformative technology. And, you know, but the question is, is how do you manage it? So you, you talk about like, you, you know, uh, uh, some of the folks that you deal with regularly. Okay, so I've got a product that I want to sell. And, and that sounds great, man. I got my dream and passion is, is to have invented and now sell this product. And so many people just don't understand how much goes into that. I mean, and that's, and once again, you know, thanks to Clarenity for not only offering solutions to people, like call someone that knows how to do it because not doing that leads to some of the things that Andrew mentioned. And look, like, like I said, you get thrown off of Amazon because you're doing something dumb or stupid. I mean, good luck getting back on. Good, cause, right. Because, you know, because the, they ain't got time for that. And it's not a human on the other side, right? It's a, it's, right, a, it's, right. a, it's a robotic computerized system that's making decisions based on rules. And if you don't follow them, you get punished. And, uh, you know, Amazon is a program that it changed the web. It changed e-commerce, uh, changed the face of business, in my opinion, simply because it focused on the customer. And so you're right. They don't really care about the brands um, to, a, to an extent. Right. And what they care about is the customers having a good experience, a trustworthy experience um, that's not too gamified. And so they put all of that, I guess, pressure and learning curve on sellers and on brands to make Amazon a place that customers keep coming back to. 
Yeah. And that, you know, some of this stuff too, and, and, you know, people have mixed opinions on Amazon. I mean, meaning sellers, cause they'll look at, at stuff and they'll say, oh, they're taking some, a big percentage of the sale. But, you know, these three PLs, third party logistics companies also relieve a lot of stuff. And, you know, I'm going to, you're going to see in the later episodes and once again, stick around uh, next week, the week after that, and one more week and all these episodes will tie together. But I'm going to, I'm actually going to sit down and talk to, you know, accounting professionals and how to keep track of all that. Cause you get into a large number of transactions and that, you know, once again, and I'm not trying to overstate Clarinity, that's a company that helps you keep track of your inventory, which is a huge thing when it comes to e-commerce. Cause If you think you have it and you don't and you sell it, you're going to lose a customer there. That's not a good experience. And if you're losing your inventory because you're not keeping track of it, uh, you're not dealing with cash flow issues or your supply chain or, but wait, this got really, really complex all of a sudden. You're like, dude, come on. Like, what do we got to do? You know, and, and, and there's a lot, you know, like so much that comes into it. and, And you also, on top of it, you know, you have all of these, I, I don't know, there's, there's just little nuances. I'll give you an example. Like the, the number one reason, okay, right. Cart abandonment. Someone goes to your site, they put it in the cart and then they leave. The number one reason that they're leaving is because they high shipping costs. And, you know, and if you don't know what you're doing up front, people want to add too many steps and, and different stuff. And like, look, Amazon changed the, the expectation for buyers and people in general. You can buy it prime. It's there the next day, sometimes the same day. And if you're not ready to compete, then you're going to have some issues. And, you know, like, I mean, you talk about like the evolution of the shopping cart and the e-commerce site. You have sites like Wix, Shopify, online marketplaces, and, you know, like, Clients uh, are are well, not clients. Sellers are typically existing in in a multi channel world where they're taking their their local logistics and spraying that out. And and by the way, we, we talked about Matt Watson and Vent Solutions. What they did was at the time they helped they help uh, car sellers put ads, take them on and offline. So they had a central thing that would get or, you know, put the ad online or take it off. Prior to that, you had a a quote internet manager that anytime they made a a price change or something, you have to go to 12 different sites, wait for it to load up. And it was like, so there's a lot of efficiency tools that go into that. And that's part of what we're also going to talk about uh, in the third episode of this series, when we get together uh, you know, with, with Clarenity's founder. And, you know, we're going to talk about, you know, the inventory management, because I'll tell you what, I, I mentioned working in, in and around the musical instrument business. Uh, dude, I, I had some, some, some accounts that I managed that were so bad with their inventory that that was what killed them. I mean, they didn't know if people were stealing from them, if they were losing stuff, if it was broken. They didn't know if it was there, if it wasn't. And I mean, that's pretty much the, the one thing you can't be bad at for too long and stay alive. What, what, you know, what do you find in that regard? I mean, honestly, I remember the early days when I was copying and pasting tracking numbers because it wasn't automated, you know, with inventory and shipments all the way down to Amazon now handling that. Um, Logistics right now in this country, I know Amazon's running at 3x of a peak season and it's in a slow season right now. And, you know, that's that's partially our climate with the pandemic and things going on. Um, but for for the brands we work with, you know, even if they're using 100 percent FBA, uh, which is fulfillment by Amazon and using Amazon's fulfillment services, I'm pushing them to set up their own, uh, integrate with a local 3PL, find a good 3PL solution, um, have inventory in both places. Obviously, you have to keep track of that and know what's going on. But when things happen where maybe Amazon's only accepting essential goods or something like that, your your other um, you know your backup shipping solution now becomes an option. And people don't understand how much money can be made or saved simply in the shipping of products. I remember um, 
at my first company, the car company, we got we were just essentially negotiating with FedEx to get these crazy low rates for for very big items, which were hitches. And the money we saved in the shipping, we were able to then be lower than people buying from us at a lower price, you know, all the way till now when we're helping people create three packs um, or variety packs on Amazon um, where you can't just sell one peanut butter, but a six pack can be profitable, quite a bit more profitable. Um, and helping people understand that as well as track the inventory, be able to set it up, be able to know, you know, what you have at any given time, um, not run out of stock on Amazon. You know how many times we've launched a brand, it takes off immediately and you know, we just aren't ready for the amount of sales that we get. And so because of that, we lose momentum because of that, we lose customers, we lose our subscribers. Um, it's a huge topic it's a huge thing that not enough people give attention to um with the attention it needs hey, that's what i'm it's some of that's gonna in the next episode of the series and series two i'm gonna sit down with Brittany brown and Brittany's the the founder and ceo of a company called ledger gurus and they're out of utah and they uh you know they work with clarinity and some other companies and they to, to if you can't if you can't track your basic numbers, you can't do the next things that are required. It makes it very difficult to track your inventory. You can't track your success, your failure. You can't manage cash flow. We're going to actually sit down and talk about you know using technology uh, to integrate all these different things. This evolution of e infrastructure is now the the winning ingredient. You know the key ingredient. And Amazon specializes in that all the way down to like looking at the number of steps someone takes from point A to point B and how do we cut a step out? So you sit there thinking it's only one step. Yeah, but if you have a, a million employees all taking an extra step a hundred times a day, it turns into a hell of a lot of steps. You're going to talk about tracking expenses. Uh, why not to make certain assumptions on things, understanding tax, understanding merchant fees, uh, checking and updating tax settings. Cause that's right. People, that stuff changes and, and, and they don't call you up meaning they, meaning the local government or someone to tell you your tax rates change a little bit. You might find yourself on the bad end of a transaction and also talking about defining and knowing deadlines. And, you know, that, that stuff's all key. And, you know, you can't begin to plan and do different stuff. I'm going <clears> to <throat> sit down in episode three with Conrad Rolletter, the, the founder of Clarinity, and talk about the different cloud-based things they do. Because like, like you mentioned, if you, if you sell out, okay, I, I spend so much time talking to entrepreneurs that are so busy trying to keep the sky from falling and planning for that. They don't give any consideration to what happens if things really go well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like if and, and you mentioned relationships with Amazon, one way to ruin it is to not get your stuff out the door on time. I mean, yep, that can totally you know, get like, you suspended. And, and you're talking about it's uh, it. I think you, the thing you're saying about like, you know, talking with an expert and there's some areas you can take on. You just can't learn everything. And in other areas, like, you know, you're talking about sales tax. Like I use tax jar for my apparel brand um, because it automatically files my sales tax for me, uh, you know, and takes away that that extra thing to do or that extra thing to pay my, you know, my accounting team to do. So there's these there's these things that can make life just so much easier if you know about them. And maybe they weren't even out last year right? That's how fast it's moving. Um, you know, it wasn't out last year. Now there is a thing. And uh, it that was part of the reason I built a team at Marknology outside of just being a, you know, a consultant in this space was there's so much to learn that I can't learn everything, uh, you know, as it, as it grew. And so, you know, I needed experts around me as well, continuing to study everything there is about photography and alt text and, you know, all the things that go into now buying through the Alexa or, uh, you know, we didn't even talk about voice and it's, a, it's impact on e-commerce, but that's a big thing, uh, you know, coming down the road. And how do you know all these things? How do you stay up to speed? You find good partners. Yeah, it's, it's true. It's true. And, you know, once again, another shout out to Clarinity. Go check them out. There's a link in the show notes, uh, C-L-E-A-R-I-N-I-T-Y.com. Uh, but, you know, what they what they do, and I, I've had a the, the opportunity to talk ahead of episode three with Conrad is, dude, these things are complex, man. You got to get them talking. Like, this is a technology provider. Now, it, it, and that stuff is not straightforward. So I've had, pe uh, okay, so at full scale where we actually, 
help companies build teams of developers. We don't do any of this stuff. Like we don't, we don't touch any of it because it's, it's a completely different type of expertise. Yeah. And look, look, if you're not, a, and here's my air quotes, tech person, you really want to get some people that are on it. Now, if you don't, you're going to probably get swallowed up by the lack of efficiency um, or losses. And sometimes those things occur uh, at, a, at a rate that you, if you're busy, you can't keep up with them and you find out later someone's been stealing from you. Maybe things aren't going fulfilled. You're not c- collecting payments. Like So at the ticket company, we would make hundreds of transactions a day, which means that at the time, well, StubHub would pay us and they would give us like, if we made a hundred sales, they would give us a hundred payments. Like we would, I'd get an email. I'd be like, you have a hundred new emails. You're like, shit, we would refer to it as our, as our StubHub blessing because we were getting paid. But then you had a hundred line items that we had to match up with the transaction. And, you know, and it wasn't until, uh, okay, we, uh, the, the specific efficiency tools ended up being created and invented for our industry. And at one point, Jill, my, my wife who worked with me, we, we said, if these tools didn't exist, we, and it, like if all of a sudden they were gone, we would qu- have quit the business. Cause some, these are all the things people are like, well, robots replace people. You know what? If they do, it's going to be because they're doing the jobs that no one wanted to do anyway. No one wants to sit there. Like e- even Brittany at, at Ledger Gurus, you know, I had a chance to, to to talk with her briefly. I had an episode two. She said, if you have an accountant that that set, that doesn't want you to integrate and use technology, you have the wrong accountant. Mm-hmm. And because no one wants to sit there and like compare all these different lines and like you got hundreds of transactions and, and now all of a sudden you're you're getting into things that are related to what we'll get into episode four because all this data and that's what you hear data 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 it's so data driven but you have to be able to understand that data and to be able to make assumptions and know where you're winning, know where you're losing to uh, start to judge trends, obtain insight, track sales, predict revenue, handle and maintain your inventory, deal with bottlenecks and different stuff. And like, this is what's what I, what makes me so passionate about tech is like, (laughs) you really can automate all the crap that no one wanted to do anyway. I mean, like uh, nothing I mentioned was uh, high up on someone's list of things they want to show up to work and do to tomorrow. So, no. you know, I mean, overall, so, so here we are and like a couple other stats, cause you know, we're, we're just scratching the surface here. Um, did you know that 43% of global shoppers, uh, research online and use social networks to do it? It's not just search engines. Like I was a little surprised with that number. And the thing that really shocked me is that clothing is the leading online vertical. And, um, and you know, I'm like in between sizes. I'm either like a 2X or an XL. So, you know, but I don't really buy a lot of clothes online. But I was really shocked that, that at, at the, at, you know, at, as of the point that my data was created, 59% of clothing purchases have gone online. Like, wow. Um, you know, and, and, and that's big. And and the next biggest uh, books, movies, music, and games, 47%. You talk about Amazon, that was originally a bookseller. So if you go to buy a copy of million dollar bedroom on Amazon, they print one book just for that order, which is also crazy. Like, and get it to you in two days. Change the game. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, he, he used books uh, I say he, as in Jeff Bezos, used books when creating Amazon to essentially build customer profiles. Um, you know that he then used to to expand into other categories. But that's really what the books were doing in those early days was um, picking something easy um, and giving people you know accessibility to it. And you know, not to just keep bringing it up, but what's going on in the country has just accelerated this timeline, I believe by five to 10 years. Um, You know, we have the older generation now buying online and getting comfortable with it and feeling safe to do it uh, because it's safer than going to a brick and mortar right now. And, uh, you know, it's just changing people's behaviors and buying habits. Um, I'm really excited to see, you know, what comes next in the brick and mortars that evolve um you know to handle the growth of e-commerce and still have a very successful experience um at their brick and mortar and it's going to be really the brands that learn how to tie it all in are be the will be the ones that are winning 
You know, th- so much about e-commerce has flipped, had flipped a brick and mortar on its side or upside down, or maybe thrown it in the gutter on some days. And then COVID came and kicked it, you know, and you just talk about, I mean, there, there are, de- there have definitely been winners and losers. And, and I honestly, I really do think it, it's all going to come down to, you know, the, 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 uh, you being able to, w- with that margins tighten in some regards, and you know you can, can have competitors from near and far, and so you know saving money is making money, and I th- uh, you know revenue is great on one side, but if you're leaking it out the other side, like you know it's uh, you you can have a solid boat on one side and a leak on the other, it doesn't matter, the boat's still leaking, and. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and so much of it too is is still evolving. You know, we we mentioned talking about like outside impacts and and things like sales tax, and like I know I've already mentioned that, but you know, while you've seen entire sub industries form, and you mentioned tax tax jar earlier, you have Al, Al, uh, Avalara and Taxify and different things, and you know, like these things are meant are built to connect with each other and can make your life easier. Uh, the problem is you know, you're looking at like, dude, there are literally like <laughs> so many tax jurisdictions and changes. And if you had, if you really saw tax code, just like federal, not even state and local, like it's volumes and there's no way to keep up with it. And I'll tell you one thing, if, if, uh, uh, taxes are tricky, man, cause the man he'll come, he's going to come take it. He's going to come right. take it, whether you want it or not. And the, the, there's no one that's going to shut you down faster than Uncle Sam when it comes to that. Have you have you got to witness that yet? Because it ha- it can happen fast and it is decisive and nasty. I haven't seen it on my side. You know, if a brand ended services with us, they'd probably just go away. I wouldn't really know the details of, of everything they're going through. But, uh, you know, in my early years, probably six, seven years ago, as a freelancer that started making good money, helping brands on Amazon and, and e-commerce, um, I definitely learned my, <laughs> my own tax lessons, uh, you know, that I've, that I've passed on to, you know, either brands or, or mentees or different things, because it can just happen so fast just by not knowing what you're doing. Um, you know, and can, you can have a great idea, a great business, uh, and it can really come out to bite you in the butt. So I'll give you an example as a seller or a manufacturer or an e-commerce owner, you're the one that's responsible for collecting and then sending that tax wherever it needs to go. And if for some reason you mess it up, you miscalculate it or something else happens, you're still responsible for it. And one of the things that without a, without a, a good tax strategy or understanding how that works or, or innovate automation, I said, like to say delegate or innovate, but if you don't have that stuff, a lot of times, uh, you know, business owners, you'll see them miscalculate and they think it's money for something else. And next thing you know, you get on the wrong side of that. And uh, like I said, man, the government's going to come get it. They'll pull, you know, if you get on the wrong side of that, they just start take. they just start garnishing it. They take it out of your, out of your, out of your anything and they'll come find it. It's not something you're going to hide in this day and age. And, and the thing is, is when they come do it, they come do it. And, you know, the, the responsibility is for you. And that also goes for your own employees. So Andrew, you know, that I, I take pride in helping people do projections and create business plans in, in some cases. And I can't tell you how many people sit down and they have a payroll number and I look at it and I'll say, do you have your burden rate calculated in that? They're like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, you have to pay taxes on the taxes your employees pay. You have other kinds of taxes and different stuff. And, and, you know, and, and then you've got insurance and all these other things. And and you see that they clearly haven't made that connection. And those things destroy projections and budgets and profitability. And um, you can put yourself in the in a really bad situation by not understanding it. I think the same thing goes for inventory management. I mean, the the prior to being an entrepreneur, the companies I worked for, well, I worked for one that was terrible at it. Guess what? They went out of business. And mm-hmm. I worked for Roland, who was masterful at it, unbelievably efficient. Like they knew where everything was, everywhere, every time all the time. And, and they're still around and they're huge. I mean, they sell $5 billion worth of stuff a year. And, you know, if they weren't able to do that, the other company I mentioned, they had terrible inventory control, terrible dude. Like it was like, 
I mean, we, they didn't, we didn't know what was at one store or the other. And it was just like, it was, it was, a, it, it, it didn't last. Cause you know, depending on what you're selling, you look at that, how, how valuable something can be. That's a palm sized item. Like, I mean, my phone's like a $1,200 phone. It's tiny. You know, how many of those do you need to lose before you're really on the bad side of, of, of a PL statement? Right. And I think that, um, you know the the times have accelerated and and put pressure on 3PLs and brands you know just with logistical issues the backlog of of um you know importing goods or exporting goods and getting the stuff you need to make your inventory and and now trucking times and um you know things being longer and it's really showing weaknesses in a lot of people's you know logistical setups uh and they're having to adapt or looking to switch and find something more effective in a bad time to do it and you got, you have, I mean, right now in this current climate, you also have weird supply chain issues, you know, like, and, and someone we've had on the podcast before, Chris Kovac of Riverwatch Beef, which is a local organic beef maker. I talked to him, I love their beef jerky. And I asked him about it. He said, well, I got to tell you before you order, I had to change the recipe. I said, why? He goes, there was a special kind of salt that they would import for it only came from Italy and without it, it, it was like a major part of the recipe. And, you know, at one point, you know, things weren't flowing in and out of Italy. I mean, for, for COVID reasons and, and that put a, I mean, it literally changed the product and you see that a lot, you know, we ran out of toilet paper quite, I mean, everyone knows that occurred and there's, and the supply chain is taxed. Now, you know, prior to COVID, so much of that stuff, the reason we ran out of toilet paper wasn't because we couldn't make toilet paper fast enough. It's a low margin prod product that has very predictable for how much is sold at a grocery store. It takes up a lot of space. And, you know, it's like one of those things, like a grocery store has to have toilet paper. They don't make a whole lot of money off of it, but you wouldn't go buy your groceries at the grocery store that didn't also have toilet paper. Right. So when all of a sudden everyone shows up and wants to buy it in bulk, it, 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 it throws predictability out the window. And, you know, and that's where we're going to begin to ra wrap this up because so much about where the the point that we're at in the e-commerce timeline and the evolution of the internet, it really is data driven. And and we'll we're gonna get into that in the following episodes. Like I said, it's gonna start with with accounting. It's gonna get in uh, we're gonna get Conrad from Clarinity in here talking about cloud-based internet or uh, excuse me, inventory solutions. And once again, huge shout out and thanks for Clarinity for stepping up and sponsoring a four-part series about some of the things they help provide solutions for, but also just like about this in general. And, you know, we haven't done this on Startup Hustle before. We've done some Amazon related episodes with you and I. We've talked to various different product makers, software companies and stuff like that, but we've never really like sat down and, and told the story of the internet. Um, what you're going to find, it, it is data, it is tech, it is integration, and it's about being in front of it. Now you get that stuff set up correctly and you find the right people people to help you. And once again, final shout out to Clarinity there. You're, you can really be, you can, you can get things going nice and smooth, man. And you can't put a price on peace of mind. So right. there's nothing better than a well-run business. Automation is awesome. If you haven't ever really explored it, you're going to punch yourself in the face after you do and realize how much stuff you were probably doing you didn't need to do. And, you know, a well thought out and created plan. Like, I, you know, look, I, I'm very well known on Startup Hustle for saying startups don't come with an owner's manual. You, you, well, yours can for e-commerce and there's like Clarinity will help you write your standard operating procedures. Look, if you've never done that, it sucks. Like we did it at full scale. I've got like a 68 page document and growing. Oh my God, it's excruciating. Cause if you don't know what you're doing, I mean, now you're trying to figure it out. Now someone that knows what they're doing can, can whoop it out. Um, but you know, there's a lot of different things and a lot of stuff that can come up. So, you know, Andrew, overall, like what's your key takeaway from this episode or what you, how do you feel overall about where we're at? in our current timeline with the, with the internets and e-commerce, like what, or maybe even what you see coming. Well, I think for me, you know, the message I would say is that continue to be a company that's willing to evolve. 
and change and test and you know what was possible what wasn't possible last year might be possible next year and um you know as someone that's been pushing this space and and pushing you know amazon consulting uh pushing the need to be on the marketplace and do it well and story tell well the best thing i can say is that it takes time it doesn't happen overnight but what you have to do is you have to try new things you have to look for new wins you have to look for new ways of doing it um and you know what i started doing versus now don't even line up in the way that i do e-commerce or like strategize or give advice around it and um i wouldn't take back what i said in those early days but i you know the advice i have now and the strategies we work with now um continue to evolve at month after month after month and uh that's just the the world we're in i think e-commerce is going to continue to change you know maybe soon we're having packages delivered by drone maybe houses are going to be sold on amazon you know who really knows we've seen cars on carvana and everything else you can imagine so uh nothing is outside the the scope of possibility and i think that um, you know, you just have to continue to stay a business that's that's willing to evolve and change. Yeah, I think that's the key, man. You, it, it well, look, and evolution's interesting because it's not always about the strongest; it's about the smartest, but really about the 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 what species or whatever is evolving its ability to adapt. And you know, in the world of technology, we talk so much about agile and scalability. And look, scalability is your ability to grow in an efficient way because you will get to a point where it's just too much. And then, you know, when I think about scalability, and this is going to truly date myself, but if you were ever a kid and you watched I Love Lucy, there's a there's a famous episode where she works at a candy factory. And at first she's, she's sitting there and she's boxing up the candy. It's coming down the conveyor belt and it starts just gradually going faster. And then it gets to the point where she can't keep up with it. She's stuffing it in her hat, down her shirt. She's eating them and all these different things. But it, it, it's, a, it's a very, uh, it's, I mean, it, it, that's a lack of scalability. It's the inability to keep up. So you got to, you know, it, if you go uh, at business school on, on the very first day, they, well, at least at a decent one, they're telling you, you got to learn how to do things better, faster, or cheaper, preferably all of them. So, you know, and you're competing with the internet made the world smaller. And if you're not able to be more efficient, to create efficiency, to do it better, faster, or cheaper, um, you're, a, you're a FedEx delivery away from someone else that might. And mm-hmm. you got to keep that in mind and, and, you know, and get into that. And that's, that's I, I hope you stick around and, and check out the other parts of the series. Cause like I said, we're really trying to bring in experts that, you know, it's one, it'd be one thing to just talk about selling stuff online, but we're not doing you much of a service. And, and, you know, that that's once again, a final thank, thank you to Claire Entity. scroll down the show notes and, and see what they do. Cause there are people out there that can help you do so much of this and let you focus on the things that your business that you, that you're either passionate about, or maybe are the, are the better value of your time. Like, you know, and, and I'll, I'll stop by saying that Kate, I talk to a lot of startup founders and I hear someone say, well, I'm not, I'm a non-technical founder. I'm actually going to host a Facebook live about this tonight. And by the time this comes out, it will have already occurred. Check, go back to the startup hustle chat room and, and check it out. And we'll be there. To, uh, Andrew, you, you show up and talk about some of your episodes there, right? Yes, sir. And want to, want to have some open knowledge about that, but you know, people are like, hey, well, I, I'm a non technical founder, so I'm going to learn how to write code. I'm like, cool, good luck. So, um, you know, like, let me know how that goes, because you know, anytime you choose to do one thing, you're choosing to not do something else, and you're gonna you're gonna have to learn a whole lot of stuff if you want to be successful as an entrepreneur, a startup founder, or in e-commerce. Speaking of doing other stuff, Andrew. I'm going to get out of here because I got to get ready for my presentation tonight. So I'll see you next time. Thanks, Matt.